Everyone, I want to talk to you today about a very important topic for investors, and that's chasing past returns. So many investors, when they're looking at a new investment, the first question they'll ask is, what are the historical returns? And the reason they're asking that is pretty simple. It's because as human beings, we're wired to believe that the future is going to be a mirror image of the past. So if we see an investment that's gone up 25%, we think it's going to be up 25% again in the future. If we see something that's doubled, we think it's going to double again. If we see something up 10x, we think it'll be up 10x again in the future. And the more extreme the performance, the more emotional we tend to get about this stuff. And we tend to buy in then at, unfortunately, at the worst possible time. And if we look back at history, there's countless examples of this. And I wanna run through a few of them with you today, starting with the dot-com bubble. This is the period in the US equity market from 1995 to 1999, where you saw the NASDAQ 100 index go up over 800%. Now, this is something we had never seen before in the history of the U.S. equity market, a major index up this much in this short period of time. That's an annualized return of 55% per year. Just a stunning, stunning increase. And if you talk to investors at the end of 1999, what were they saying? Well, things like there's been a paradigm shift. Valuation doesn't matter anymore. The internet has changed everything in order to make riches in the future you need to buy these stocks you need to buy growth technology dot com stocks that the future is going to look very much like the recent past now what actually happened over the next five years the story was completely different so you have the nasdaq 100 peaking here in march 2000 ends up going down over 80 percent to its low in october 2002 and five years later you have that nasdaq 100 index down over 50 percent Next, let's talk about the housing bubble. It's a period from 2002 to 2006 where you just saw a parabolic move higher in U.S. home prices, biggest run-up we saw in U.S. history. And you had areas like Miami that were up 126% over a five-year period, just an incredible increase in a short period of time. And if you talk to investors at the end of 2006, they were extremely bullish about the housing market in areas like Miami in particular. You had people flying down to Miami, buying multiple homes, using leverage, saying you need to get exposure to this asset class because it's only going to go up from here. They're saying things like U.S. home prices never go down, buy as much of it as you can, and that you're going to experience continued gains. And what actually happened over the next five years well, very different picture. Home prices actually went down nationally by a good amount, but in places like Miami, they were absolutely crushed. So bigger gains on the upside, much bigger losses on the downside, cut in half over the next five years. Next, let's talk about peak oil. This may or may not, not be something that you're familiar with, but if you were an investor back in June, 2008, this is all anyone could talk about. And the reason why was that crude oil had gone up 335% over the previous five years, just an unbelievable increase. So there was this theory that everyone was talking about called peak oil, which is simply the idea that production for oil had peaked or was about to peak and is going to move lower. And therefore the supply of oil is going to be way down. And with continued demand for oil, of course, that's going to drive the price of oil up to unbelievable levels. So crude oil was already up at $140 a barrel in June, 2008. And people were talking about $200 a barrel oil, $300 a barrel, even higher for the price of oil. So a lot of money flooding into crude oil or energy stocks, looking to capitalize on further gains uh, in this commodity. And what happened over the next five years? Well, very different picture. And very quickly in the back half of 2008, we saw the price of crude oil crash. You had the global financial crisis worsen. During that period of time, you had the recession in the U.S. actually become the worst since the Great Depression. That drove demand way down, and the price of crude oil went down with it. And five years later, you had crude oil 28% lower. And if we look where we are today for crude oil, still well below that 2008 peak. Next, let's talk about the gold mania. And gold, very emotional asset class. People either love it or hate it. And they really love gold the most after it's done well. So if we go back to August 2011, 192% increase for gold over the preceding five years. There was a lot of love for gold, of course, at the time. 
And there were many reasons for that. Really, the macro narrative were all uh, favorable to gold. If we look at the narratives at the time, it was uh, there, we had just left the global financial crisis, but people were talking about a double dip recession. People were talking about quantitative easing from the Federal Reserve, 0% interest rates. And a lot of people were saying you need to buy gold as a store of value that the US dollar was going to collapse and the gold was the best way to capitalize on that and make uh, a lot of money going forward. And looking at returns similar to the past, people are thinking that's going to continue. So you had just a ton of money flowing into gold, gold miners and the funds uh, that represent them. And you had that GLD ETF, the gold ETF, actually become the largest ETF in the world for a brief moment in time in August, 2011. And what happened next the price of gold did not continue to go up it started to go down five years later you see the price of gold down 28 percent last i want to talk about the something recent here the growth stock bubble which really uh became about in 2020 and 2021 which we saw just parabolic move higher for technology and growth stocks very similar to the dot-com bubble and really the fund that came to represent this bubble was the ARK Innovation ETF. And this ETF was actually up 778% over this five-year period from February 2016 to January 2021. Unbelievable advance. We hadn't seen anything like it since the dot-com bubble. And all of its holdings were story stocks, technology stocks, high growth stocks. And if you talk to investors in early 2021, they were saying things similar to the dot-com bubble, saying valuations don't matter. You have to, to buy these innovative companies that you're going to get similar gains in the future if you buy them. And so what happened is all of the money into this fund, over 90% of the assets in the fund came in during this last year with much of it coming in the few months before it peaked. So you have investors chasing that extreme performance coming in near the top. And we don't yet have a five-year period following this January 2021 level, but so far, we see seen something similar to the aftermath of the dot-com bubble where all of these high growth companies have come back to earth in terms of valuations that's driven down the return of this fund down over 70 percent in just a little over two years so what is the commonality here well the names change so we've talked about uh, technology stocks we talked about gold we talked about housing oil, the names change in every cycle, but really the underlying story remains the same, which is that chasing performance is not a good strategy for investors. It really hurts investors because they tend to chase performance after the fact. And then you see a reversion to the mean where simply the concept that something that's done exceptionally well tends to come back to earth and even, even underperform going forward, which is another way of saying the best performing asset classes and funds go on to oftentimes become the worst. And we can see that not only in asset classes, but in mutual funds, many studies have shown something similar to this, which is that if you had bought the top decile funds, so the best performers over a three year period, you actually would have done worse than buying the worst performing funds uh, looking forward. So you're seeing that mean reversion play out in many areas of the market. And because we're human beings, because we're emotional, because we like to chase, we buy after the fact, and we often sell only after extreme underperformance, there's a behavior gap for investors, which is simply the concept that investor returns trail the actual returns of the fund. And we see this across asset classes. So we see it in equity funds bond funds, alternative funds, allocation funds, same story again and again, investors are buying high and selling low repeatedly, and that's leading to lower returns than the funds they're actually investing in. And so the question you should be asking is, well, how do I avoid this as a human being? How do I avoid the siren song of eye popping returns? It really seems impossible to resist it. Well, I think there's a few things that you can do as an investor, number one, learn the lessons of history, which is really what we're doing here today. Go back in history, look at examples where investors chased performance and that led to adding risk into their portfolio at the worst possible time and led to worse returns going forward. So learning those lessons of history, trying not to repeat them, that's one thing you can do. Number two, 
try to stay grounded. So we're emotional, we're wired to be fearful and greedy and having a plan can help you stay grounded. So if you have a diversified portfolio, have a plan to stick with that, to rebalance at times when asset class weights get out of a certain range. So if you had a lot of technology stocks back in 1999, well, they would have very quickly become a big part, part of your portfolio. So having a plan to rebalance by selling some of that asset class that has done well and adding to other asset classes that haven't done as well, well, that will help mitigate the risk in your portfolio and hopefully help avoid you know, having that reversion to the mean in your portfolios. Number three, this is an important one, simply find a better reason to buy. So if chasing performance and buying based on performance is not a good reason, it's actually going to lead to worse returns. Well, why should you add a new investment to your portfolio? Well, I would say you need to ask the question, well, what value is it adding to your existing holdings? What is it adding something in terms of a, a return diversifier, a risk mitigator? It has to look different than something in, in your portfolio. It can't be that you're buying simply because of performance, because as we've seen, that is simply not a good reason to buy something. So the next time you're tempted to go all in, on the latest investment fad. And believe me, there's gonna be many more in the future. Run through this checklist. And remember, the past is gone. Don't chase it.